Hello, I needed full duplex real-time bi-directional communication for implementing a multiplayer video game on a web server I wrote in C. First, let's do a high-level overview of what WebSocket protocol is and why I want to use it. So, here's the application level anatomy of a TCP connection. First, we listen on the server and then accept connect attempts from the client. Then, we have an open connection we can write bytes to or read bytes from. On Linux and many other operating systems, this is interfaced as an open file that we write to or read from. For this, we use the send and receive functions. You can look all of these functions up with the man command in your terminal right now in section 3. But this isn't a Berkeley Sockets video. I may do another video on this topic later. This is a WebSockets video, and I'll blissfully assume that we have a TCP connection we can open, read and write to, and then close with these function calls. So, why do I need WebSockets? What does it have to do with HTTP? Uh, here's HTTP. My deep dive into HTTP and OSI is linked in the description if you don't speak HTTP yet. The client opens a connection, requests resources with HTTP, receives them, and then closes the connection. I'm making a real-time multiplayer video game, so this presents multiple problems. Firstly, each request needs to be initiated by the client, and then the client expects a response. And we have the overhead of these headers. Additionally, it would be inconvenient to have my connection closed after a concluded message exchange. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a full duplex connection where we can send arbitrary binary data in both directions at any time on a persistent open connection without the latency of handshakes? Much like you would do in conventional network programming, not involving a web browser. This is precisely what you get with WebSockets. You are graced with VIP access to the underlying TCP connection to use mostly as you please. If you need a WebSocket header, um, you need a WebSocket header in every message, but we'll get to that. It's only a few bytes long. So, um, yeah, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Surely somebody has implemented this protocol for us. So I searched for libraries implementing WebSockets I could use. I found nothing that didn't present boundaries to immediate consumption by my infantile brain. That being as it were, I had the idea to stop looking for the most tolerable software library and instead implement the WebSocket protocol myself. It turned out to be pretty easy as far as protocols go, but it still had its quirks. Uh, here's the documentation I read. It explains the whole protocol in exquisite detail, but I'll show it to you now in action, and link this in the description below, of course. Back to the diagram. So, how do I get myself from my, uh, how do I get myself my own coveted WebSocket connection? Well, I open a HTTP connection, and I ask the server for it nicely. Here's what that looks like similar to what we had before. It's also just a HTTP uh, request and response. So the server can agree to this in what's called the WebSocket handshake. We'll look at the code soon. The open TCP session that was being used for this HTTP request, the same one, uh, is from that point forward a WebSocket session after the upgrade request they immediately start communicating like this. This is just a TCP session, but with WebSocket, uh, WebSocket headers in every packet, both ways. We've established why I want this in my program and what it looks like. This is the part where we get cozy and look at the code. Here, uh, here is a WebSocket HTTP request that I've intercepted in the debugger. Uh, intercepted in the debugger. The first, um, the first part of the WebSocket handshake, the request from the client, the HTTP request. It's a HTTP GET request from the client, except um, it's got this special header here. It's got this special header we're interested in. 
you can see in my HTTP header, uh, HTTP get handler function, that I search for this header explicitly. Uh, let's look at this function that builds the uh, WebSocket response, the HTTP response that we talked about to accept the uh, WebSocket upgrade. So, um, it, uh, yeah, it's short, it's a short function. It has one job. I get a random key from the client. We saw that over here. I've got this uh, random WebSocket key over here from the client in that one single header. We don't care about the other one. Um, there's another one here. We don't, we don't care about that. I just care about this one for my implementation. Um, yeah, so I get a random key from the client. I need to mutilate it and send it back to the client. The WebSocket standard mandates specifically the following. I, uh, yeah, here, that's implemented in this function. I take the WebSocket key, the encode, the WebSocket key, which is just a string. You can see that here from the data type. Um, I append this specific constant string to the end of it. I compute the SHA-1 hash of that into a buffer. I base64 encode the entire result. And then that is what I send back to the, um, over here, that's what I send back to the client, the result of this computation uh, in the sec websocket accept header, uh, like we saw in the diagram. Over here, set uh, websocket except that goes back to the client, so the client knows the handshake is concluded. And that's it. We've told the client that we're happy to accommodate a websocket connection. Um, SHA-1 hashing and base64 encoding are just algorithms to garble and mutate the string in a specific way and are outside the scope of this video. They're simple in concept if you want to look them up, though. Now we have our own TCP connection to use as we please. Well, not quite. I mentioned WebSocket headers. We need to intercept the um, incoming WebSocket headers and construct valid response headers. So let me find the decode function. Here we go. Um, so here are the incoming, uh, this function parses incoming WebSocket headers on that TCP connection. In the same way you would parse HTTP, this just takes that incoming byte stream from the TCP socket and starts interpreting it. So, uh, the first byte that we get in the WebSocket header is a constant denoting the packet type. It can be binary or string format. I always use binary. Um, it can be a fin packet, which denotes if it's a fragment of a message or not, but all of my WebSocket packets are fin packets, as I'm not using the protocol to send large amounts of contiguous data, I need to split up into multiple messages. So, I think this is always just x81 that I get uh, sent from the client, something like that, x81, not sure. Uh, that's the first byte of the WebSocket header that I get on that TCP connection. So the length of the payload is encoded in the next 1 to 9 bytes after the first byte we just discussed. If your payload contains fewer than 126 bytes, uh, then the single byte is the size of your message. So one byte for the fin and opcodes, as well, uh, byte or string format. And um, the second byte, byte number 2, for the payload length. Unless... <laughs> Um, yeah, the constants 126 and 127 indicate that we're using more bytes to encode the WebSocket payload length in bytes. The payload is a name for the data that isn't a header. I hope that wasn't confusing. Um, yes, and finally we have masking. The Packets coming from the browser client are all masked using a 4-byte value. We apply this little algorithm uh, to unmask our payload data within the incoming packets from the client. For a full understanding, pause the video and examine this section of the code. 
Uh, alternatively, this is detailed in the article I've linked in the description. The main takeaway is that the whole payload is garbled, and we use some bytes in the WebSocket header to ungarble it. Right. Right WebSocket header. When sending packets to the client, we construct the same headers, but simpler. I only implement the 126 uh, switch here, not 127, because I do not need to send that many bytes um, in a single packet. The server also doesn't need to garble the payload with masking, so I don't need to write that. Thank goodness. I don't know, just as per the WebSocket standard, me as the server, I don't need to implement the um, masking we did here. Just the browser client does that to all of its WebSocket packets it sends me. Not sure why. Um, yes, so... That's my working websop. Uh, that's my working websocket implementation. Let's unpause it in the debugger and look at the result in the browser. So it's paused right now, and I've got an open browser over here. Um, yeah, nothing's happening right now. This is the game I'm implementing. I will unpause it. And uh, here, at the bottom, we can see the WebSocket headers. Exactly like we just talked about. This is what I get sent, and this is what I respond with. I hope that's big enough to see. Um, hmm. I, uh, I left the... Uh, uh, yeah, I left the connection idling too long, so I'm going to restart that. And let's see WebSockets in action now. Let's skip through this logon process. And... It's uh, hit the breakpoint again in the debugger on the uh, send web WebSocket response. I can continue it, and now WebSockets have kicked in. Here we go. We're sending these pings around, and uh, you can see I've got text rendering, and there's a character rendering. Um, I've parsed out the name of the character that we gave into the login, and that's being displayed on the screen through WebSockets. And uh, here's the uh, console output of the WebSocket data flying around. It's just TCP packets. Um, here I'm sending custom WebSocket pings from the client to the server uh, to keep the connection alive and uh, yeah so for an example of WebSockets in action I'm clicking off the edge of the map and I'm sending those coordinates uh, over to the server which validates them correct them and sends back the validated coordinates to the client which then repositions the character to be within the bounds of the map so Interestingly, when I then disable the server, when I turn it off, and the WebSockets are no longer working, I can move off the edge because the server no longer uh, accepts the WebSocket packets and uh, validates them. So, uh, there we have it. Uh, thus, we have real-time, full-duplex TCP communication in a browser, and hopefully learned a thing or two along the way. Oh, and... It's all encrypted. TLS uses public key exchange and symmetric ciphers to secure all communication at the transport level. So, doesn't affect what we're doing at all. Um, the project with all source code is linked in the description. Have a splendid day, everyone.